Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on employee interviewing, uh, employee selection interviewing. Uh, my name is Rick Hughes, and I'm a human resources director with the Department of Human Resource Management. And I'm delighted to be here today to share with you some tips on conducting effective employment interviews. As I prepared for this webinar, I reflected upon the first interview I had when I was first hired by the state of Utah. This was back some 25, 26 years ago nearly. And I was asked a question during that interview that always left an impression on me. Uh, the question was, what is the purpose of the employee selection process, of course, of which the interview is part? And my response to that question was really quite simple. My response was to select the best candidate. And as I reflected upon that, I, I, you know, I, I really think that that's the response that got me the job. That was something that the hiring manager was looking to hear. And even though my response was simple, it was what the interview kind of focused on it, and so I, w I was selected for the position. Now, looking back, I don't, I don't now believe that that was a great interview question. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it is an important thing to keep in mind when we're conducting interviews. Our goal is to find, to select the best candidate from among those candidates we're interviewing for the job. So with that in mind, we'll begin. All right, so the intent of the webinar today is to help you be a more, more effective in interviewing job candidates. Um, I, I believe that interviewing job candidates, selecting uh, people for, for the roles that you have within your organization is one of your most important functions. You're not only staffing the organization for today, but also in some ways for tomorrow, because these employees that we select might in fact be the leaders of, of tomorrow. So it's a very important role that you have as you select new hires into the organization. The webinar is intended to provide general guidance only. I ask that you, of course, work within your agency policies and protocols on interviewing, and you certainly consult with your HR representative as you design uh, selection processes that you'll use for specific vacancies. Uh, the last job that I recruited for and interviewed for was an e-learning instructional designer. I want you to give you a moment or two to take a look at the job task. So as I set about determining what I wanted in a candidate, I, I looked at a very thorough job description. I actually crafted this myself. I, I identified, what is it I want this person to do? And I, and I came up with these task statements. And I want you to just say, take a few moments and, and look at those so you don't, you don't kind of generally what's there. I, I think you'll notice immediately that these tasks are very technical in nature. Uh, like many state jobs, this position requires a lot of technical capabilities, uh, abilities with YouTube and video and, and so on. Maybe not technical capabilities that your jobs require, but certainly technical capabilities that are, that are relevant to this position. So, so what I did based on that, I, I determined, okay, so what are the technical competencies for this position? And I said, well, they certainly have to understand adult learning theory, which is, you know, how do we train adults, because it is a training position. They have to understand instructional design techniques, and there's a specific procedure called ADDI that we use in instructional design that was important. They have to have a, a knowledge base of graphic arts and, and video production. So those were some of the knowledge sets that I anticipated the best candidate would have. In addition, I determined a number of applications the person I hire should be able to use, and these included Google Sites, Google Drive and Forms, a couple of Adobe products there, uh, Dreamweaver to do some basic HTML and, and understand how to use YouTube for video hosting. So these were the, the technical competencies that I identified for that job. Now, let me ask a question. So when we're determining, when we're trying to determine interview questions, what's most important to the job? Is it the technical skills? Should our interview be focused on the technical skills? Or should it be focused perhaps on the soft skills? So the technical skills would be those that I've just talked about for this particular job. And the soft skills might include things such as the ability to interact with others. Or are both of these important to success on the job? Well, here we have our poll results. It looks like 6% of you identified the technical skills as being really important. 3% uh, of you identified the soft skills as being really important. And 91% of you identified the both of the above being really, really important. Well, you know what? I, I agree with all of you. <laughs> I, I, I truly do. I mean, both, both skill sets are, are critical to job functions. Sometimes we have a tendency as hiring managers to favor those technical skills because we know how valuable those are. And we may feel that we can work with anybody as long as they have those technical skills that we need. Whereas others of us realize that those soft skills are really critical, particularly if the job involves a lot of interaction with others. So I, I agree mostly, of course, with the people that said C, that said both of both of the above are important for success on the job. 
Uh, you probably all know who Herb Keller, Kelleher is. He was the founder and CEO of Southwest Airlines, which, of course, over the last what, 20, 30, 40 years has enjoyed tremendous success in the avi aviation industry. And Herb Kelleher is famous for saying this, you don't hire for skills, you hire for attitude. You can always teach skills. Now, I think I understand Herb's message here, and I, I hope he didn't intend to do that for pilots, because I, I, I prefer a, a very skillful pilot. But nonetheless, I think the point is well taken, that while those technical skills are critical, we, we, I think we want to focus at least part of that selection process, principally the interview, on the soft skills. And we'll talk more about that. But first, let's see if we can't deal with the technical skills. So we've identified all those technical competencies up front. And what I want to say is that your screening of applicants needs to start with the online application process. Uh, most of you have probably heard of State Jobs 2.0. Uh, this is where candidates for employment uh, or, or persons desirous for state employment will submit their application. And within that application, we're allowed to ask, uh, we, working with your recruiter, you can set up what are called screening and supplemental questions. The screening questions are generally questions that would be answered yes or no. Uh, for example, if, we were, if I were recruiting for this e-learning instructional designer, I might ask the question, do you have experience with e-learning applications, yes or no? The second question might be, do you have experience with video production, yes or no? So these are two critical skill sets that our candidates must have experience with if they're going to be successful. Now beyond that, uh, there, within, your, within your sphere of, of things, within your jobs, there may be licensing requirements or specific educational requirements. And if those exist, if, for example, persons must have a bachelor's degree based on code or based on some other sort of statute, then we can include that there. Do you have a bachelor's degree in, in whatever discipline is, is relevant? Or if there's a specific license required, uh, you, can, you can ask that in the screening questions. And, and generally speaking, like I said, screening questions are responded to with yes or no. They're used by the analysts to very quickly identify those who may be qualified or those who are minimally qualified for, for the position. Beyond that, we have supplemental questions. And, and I think these two can be used to ascertain the skills that that incumbent or that, that applicant might bring to the table. In the supplemental questions, we can identify our experience and educational preferences. Let's say that we have a job that legitimately might require a bachelor's degree or an advanced degree, we can identify that there. Do you have a bachelor's degree or, or uh, indicate below the level of educational attainment you've achieved and from a drop down they select a bachelor's degree, an associate's degree, a master's degree, a doctorate degree or whatever, to the extent that those educational qualifications are relevant, that's certainly a good supplemental question. We might also ask candidates to self-identify their proficiency levels in, in the applications, for example, that I identified. You know, specify your proficiency level in using Google Docs or the Google suite of apps or the Adobe, Adobe Captivate or whatever other uh, product that we, we, we use within the organization. We might have them identify that proficiency level there. So once again, questions in the supplement area are used to, we've, we've determined candidates who appear to be minimally qualified. Now we're going to try to explore their qualifications a little bit more thoroughly. We may even have candidates write some sort of narrative response here that would have to be evaluated at some point, either by you, the hiring manager, or by the HR analyst with, with help from you. And it would be for them to describe their experience, for example, doing the technical things associated with the job. We, truly, we usually try to avoid the behavioral elements of the job in our screening process. Rather, we, we emphasize the technical things. Both those things are minimum, that are minimal required as well as those supplemental questions that will help us to determine who's most qualified for the interviews. So the bottom line is that the screening process begins with the State Jobs 2.0 application, and it should emphasize the technical aspects of the job. You may also do, choose to do some sort of in-person skill assessment. Let's say that you know, people are saying that they have the qualifications, that you want them to approve it. And so for a given job, you might require a candidate to bring to the interview some kind of work sample or portfolio. Let's say, for example, for this e-learning position, uh, we expect them to have produced some sort of e-learning product. Well, we want them to bring that so they could share that with all of us so we could see how they did. Uh, we might have them do some sort of computer application test. Let's say that it require, our job requires the use of Word or Excel, and so we want them to provide a writing sample. We want them to do something as they're sitting there in the office in Word and Excel just to prove that they're proficient 
in, in those areas. We might, uh, the job might involve making presentations. So we might have the candidate make some sort of presentation. Let's say it's a trainer job or a job that might ultimately present information be, uh, in front of other employees. We'll certainly want them to demonstrate that ability to make presentations. Uh, the job may involve uh, working with others, and so perhaps we can create some kind of role play that might assess their skills in, in, in listening and in communicating and, and doing those things that are required as, as they interact with others. Uh, I ask, now while all these assessments are potentially legitimate, it's important for you to work with your HR analysts within your field office to design what these might look like if you were to choose to use those. So once again, these are things that you might have a candidate do when they come to the interview as part of that interview process to ensure that they have the skills that you're, you're looking for. I, I now want to transition and talk about the, the principal topic of today's webinar, and that's uh, developing effective interview questions. We're going to be talking at length about behavioral interview questions today, but I, I first want to say what are non-behavioral questions. Non-behavioral questions are generally questions that ask for factual information or understanding of a topic, uh, such as the question that I used at the beginning of the webinar, what is the purpose of the employee selection process? That's a non-behavioral question asking for factual information. It was an okay question. It certainly worked out for me. I think I got the job because of my response to that question. but. It, it truly, that question may have been asked more effectively through that screening process on the application rather than in an interview where it, it takes more time and, and so on. So once again, it may be okay, but it may not be the most efficient way to use your interview time. Another non-behavioral question is the hypothetical question, generally asking what if. Uh, so what if this happened, what would you do is generally how those questions are posed. And, and the problem with those, we, we, we kind of discourage those, generally speaking, because more often than not, the candidate is going to give you a response that they think you want to hear rather than something that you would actually do or that you actually have done. And so they're not all, oftentimes very reflective of what the candidate truly will do uh, if, they, if they were selected for the position. We, so we generally discourage questions of a hypothetical nature. What we're going to talk at length about today are behavior-based questions. Most of you have probably heard, of this, heard this term before, and many of you probably use behavior-based questions already. But as you know, or is, these questions deal with what have you done when. They, they're generally posed in that format. What have you done when this happened? Uh, they're actual, they're reality-based. We expect the candidate to actually reflect upon their experiences and share an experience with you that demonstrates that they're able to deal with a situation as you've posed. They're based on the premise that past behavior is a predictor of future behavior. And this is kind of a, a long time established principle that things that we, we tend to do the same things over and over again as human beings. And so if we behave a certain way in the past, chances are we're going to exhibit those same behaviors in the future. So that's the, the basic fundamental uh, aspects of, of behavioral interview questions. Now let me share with you some additional information. All right. So in order to interview behaviorally, we got to first identify the behavioral competencies. So considering this job, this e-learning instructional designer job, we've already talked about the technical aspects of the job. Now let's talk about the behaviors that, that an effective person in that role needs to exhibit. And so one of the effective behaviors that I've identified very quickly is customer focus. This person's going to be producing products for others, thus it must be focused on that customer's needs. Another area of, of behavior that has, we have high expectations for is the ability to work with others, to interpersonally re relate to others, uh, to, to you know, solve interpersonal problems and, or to avoid conflicts and that sort of thing. So we want them to be able to work as a team member. Another behavioral aspect is communication. They need to communicate clearly and in, 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 uh, verbally and in writing. Many of the products that they produce will be, be based on communication, so they need to be good communicators. They need to be attentive to detail. Uh, the, the, the products that they produce are, are relatively complex, and so they need to review those products for detail before they put them out in production. They need to complete tasks on time. They need to be oriented towards making the timelines associated with the tasks. They need to be involved in continuous learning. Uh, E-learning is a, is a new field, uh, and, it, and it's quickly changing. A lot of the technologies are, so the person we hire for this role must be a continuous learner. They need to uh, uh, be creative at times and solve problems. So they may find some sort of problem as there, there may be some issue that's brought to their attention that requires uh, some problem solving skills or it might require some sort of creative solution. So they need to bring that to the table. 
They need to have initiative to fill in those gaps of time where maybe they don't have a project that they're working on. They need to take the initiative to do other things that add value to our organization. And finally, they need to be good at managing projects and, and multitasking, so keeping two or three projects up in the air at the same time and, and, and managing those projects through the, through the life cycle. So these are the, as I sat down and looked at the job description, so I considered the primary tasks that are, that are identified here, those primary tasks that we've seen before that are predominantly technical in nature. And then from that, I, I made an inferential leap, if you will. Uh, and I identified competencies, and you'll notice there that the, some of the competencies that we had on that last slide appear here, customer focus, teamwork, interpersonal relations, communication, and so on. And from that now, I, I've identified question categories. And in just a moment, I'm going to share with you a, 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 a PDF that contains, oh, hundreds of behavioral interview questions. And these are some of the categories within that PDF that I thought might be relevant to the competencies that I that I wanted to assess, and so I'll set that up. So basically, what the, what this shows is we we got our required tasks. From that, we've inferred our behavioral competencies, and from that, we've identified okay, where are where am I going to find questions to assess those behavioral competencies? Before we go on to that uh, manual containing all those interview questions, I want to provide uh, uh, this information here. The questions in this manual that I'm going to share are generally approved for your use. Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, uh, it means that to the extent that they're job related and, and useful to you as an interview, uh, as, a, as a hiring manager, then they're, they're likely going to be a good question for you. But that the job relatedness is important to establish. So work with your HR analyst to ensure that the questions you intend to ask are job related. Uh, let me just let you know that these questions were found in the public domain. They were put out there and they, they, they said that you can copy these freely, you can use them freely within your organizations. Uh, I have noticed that there are a few typos in this manual and so if we could fix them we would but it was, we, we uh, received this document as a PDF and so it's a little bit challenging to fix those typos. Uh, also, some of the questions may appear to be more private sector oriented than they are public sector oriented but I, I think you'll find plenty of questions that will suit your needs as well. Uh, let me just say that these questions can be modified and perhaps should be modified to meet your specific needs. And in many respects, they provide an example. And from that example, I, I hope you can construct a real good, powerful question for your use. Uh, these questions will be found on the employee gateway under training resources. And I'll, and I'll show you how to find that in just a few moments so that you can go find it yourself. And then I provided the URL there. So uh, given that, let me just share with you how these questions are found. Let me move over my browser window here. And I'm going to type in uh, interview questions into this search box. It's all ready to go for me there. And I find here this competency-based interview question resource manual. That's what we'll be looking at, and that's the, the resource I, I'm providing you. What we've done to this manual is, is added some navigation to it that I hope will make it very easy for you to find potentially relevant questions for the for the uh, for the interviews that that you'll hold, and so you'll notice here if I click on this table of contents button, it'll take me to the table of contents contents, and all of these are hot links. They they link out to the questions within these domains, and so you'll notice there's adaptability, ambig uh, tolerance for ambiguity, analytical thinking, and so on. You'll recall I shared with you this little. Uh, uh, picture here where I had my identified competencies, customer focus, for example, and the question category. So I've already looked at this list of, of, of question categories and identified, well, where might I find questions related to customer focus? And so I've chosen a couple of areas here. One of them is customer commitment. So if I click on, if I find customer commitment here, I scroll down, there we have it right there. So if I click on that, I go out to some interview questions. And so these are a number of behavioral interview questions that are kind of intended to address customer commitment, customer commitment as it's defined here. And so the first question on the list is describe uh, your, uh, your customers for me, both internal and external, and your level of interaction. So it's just kind of getting at how do they interact with customers? What, what are they accustomed to in terms of interacting with customers? Probably not a very strong behavior-based question. It may kind of give a general idea as, as to how they've worked with customers, but you might want to add something to this to make it a better question. So let's scroll down a little bit. Uh, let's look at item number six. 
Uh, tell me about a time, uh, tell me about a situation rather, when you had to deal with a difficult customer or client. What did you do? How effective was it? So that's a real good behavior-based question. So you've had, you have challenges with a particular customer. What did you do? How did you, uh, how, how did you solve it? Another one right above that, number five. Give me an example of when you had to form a relationship with a customer you really disliked in order to get your job done. What steps did you take to form the relationship and what was the outcome? So there's a couple of examples of questions there that might be relevant to the job for which you're interviewing. So let's go back to our table of contents. To go back, you just click on the table of contents button. And once again, we'll bring up our little uh, sheet here that identifies the uh, competencies and their categories. And let's say we wanted to look at timely completion of tasks. So I've identified a couple of possible question categories here, follow-up being one of them. Uh, so let's look at the follow-up. Here we go. I'll click on that. And here's some questions. Uh, number one. Uh, describe your best practices when you have, have, when you have follow-up actions to take. Provide an example. Might be a relevant question to our needs. Uh, and then at number three, how do you determine when a key deadline or commitment cannot be met? What action do you take uh, is, is another possible question. So once again, we, we offer you this, this uh, booklet or this, this uh, manual of interview questions, and we hope you find some use in them. Uh, you know, the, the bottom line is you identify the behavioral competencies that you're looking for in a candidate, and then you can go out to our, your table of contents and look for possibilities. What, what categories might include questions that might be asked in an interview? What is, is building effective teams important to me? If I'm hiring for a management a supervisory role, that certainly might be. Is conflict resolution important to me? This person must have the ability to resolve conflicts because they're inevitable within our line of work is decision making and so on. So based upon the behaviors you've identified as being relevant to the job, you can use this manual to identify possible interview questions. I want to take a break right now uh, to see if you have any questions of me before we move on with the rest of the presentation. So once again, this is the table of contents for the document. So these are our categories, adaptability being one. wasn't a, one, it wasn't a competency that I identified, but here you have some possible interview questions to assess adaptability if that's a relevant uh, competency required by the job. The first one being, uh, tell me about a time when you had to change priorities because of a change in circumstances or plans. How did you handle it and what was the result? That's the typical format for a behavior-based interview question. We ask them about a situation, how did they handle it, and what was the result of their action. So that's, that's, that might be a good question if you were to assess adaptability. I'm asked the question, should all questions be behavior-based? I would say not necessarily, but a preponderance of the questions should be behavior-based. I think, you know, like, like I, I tried to explain earlier, we should try to assess those technical skills through the application process, as well as through some sort of demonstration of the technical skills. And so I, I, would, I would suggest that we should emphasize the behavior-based interview questions within our interviews. I, I think you'll find that they're very enlightening, that, uh, that they're, they're pretty powerful in, in if, we, if we conduct the interview correctly, they're pretty powerful in, in letting us know who this perspective higher is. And so I would highly recommend that. But there certainly may be opportunities for you to ask about other things as well. I'm asked the question, how many questions for each competency would you suggest we ask? Well, it really depends, and, and you know, for, for the job that I've uh, used as an illustration here, I've identified like eight or nine competencies, and if I were to ask one question for each of those, comp for each of those competencies, I'd probably have an interview that's already too long. And so really what you want to focus on is what's really critical. And so you, you may want to ask one question, then possibly have some follow-up questions in mind just to make sure that you understand their behavior as, as completely as possible in that area. Uh, if there's a real area of emphasis for, your, for, your, uh, for, the, for the job, let's say customer focus, real area of emphasis, and by all means ask more than one question. Keep in mind that interviews of a behavioral nature tend to take longer than, than other types of interviews, and so you can't have, you, 
you, you might have too many questions. If you, if you only have a half hour with the candidate, you want to probably limit the number of questions you ask. So you may not be able to double down on any particular competency. Uh, the next question is, do you need to get approval from HR to use any of these questions, or are, are they already approved? Uh, they are generally approved, so long as they're job related. Now, within your specific agency, you might have some sort of protocol where you submit your questions to HR, you submit your questions to the HR analyst prior to interviewing candidates. If that's the protocol, you still must do that. But if you're generally on your own to ask interview questions, and the questions that you find in this manual are job related, you've made the connection between the tasks that the individual performs and the competencies that are required, I would say they, they're, they're good questions to ask. All right, so we've talked about um, the interview questions in the guide. You know, so we have the, the foundation for how to ask a behavioral question. Generally speaking, it's tell me about a time when and what was the result. Right, is, is kind of the general basis. So there is a way to ask skill-based questions using the behavioral interview process. And generally, this is a shell for what that might look like. So for example, tell us about a time when you use that skill, that application, or what have you, to accomplish this, if that makes sense. So let me give you an example. Uh, we're, we're talking, we've used the e-learning instructional designer as a, as a, uh, a subject for this, for this particular webinar. And so here's a question that I might ask. Tell us about a time when you use your knowledge of adult learning theory to produce an online learning module. How did this impact your course design? And so in many respects, this is not only looking for what they've done or what they can do, but it's looking for how they've applied they're, they're, it's looking for their understanding of adult learning theory and how that applies to creating e-learning modules. So it, it, it kind of was, a, in some sense, a multifaceted assessment of their, their skills and their experience in the same question. Another favorite so topic of mine is, uh, is pivot tables. Now, I don't use them, nor do my staff, generally speaking, but it's, it's a skill set that's kind of rare for people to effectively use pivot tables. I mean, if, if, we, if we need them to use pivot tables, we, we want to make sure that they, they know how to use pivot tables. For those of you who don't know, pivot tables are a function of Excel that allow you to take large amounts of data and, and make sense of it. Uh, so uh, a question, you know, if you're interested in their ability to use pivot tables using the behavioral uh, based interview question model is, tell us about a time when you use pivot tables to analyze a complex data set. What was the data set and information need? What result did you achieve? And so once again, it's a way to use the behavior-based interview process to ask questions about skills. So most of us are fundamentally interested in both behaviors and skills, and so we can use a behavior-based interview uh, process to ask about both. All right. While, while these questions might sound wonderful, there are some key things to keep in mind to conduct an effective behavioral interview. We've, we've mentioned some of these uh, in, in, in just, just a few moments ago, but I want to reiterate them. With a behavior-based interview question, you're going to have to give the person sufficient time to respond. Uh, as, you, as you think about these questions yourself, you, you, you realize that, yeah, I'm going to have to reflect on ex an experience I've had. And so we, we've got to make sure that we give that candidate who we're interviewing enough time to respond. We've got to display patience. Uh, that, okay, you know, I, we, we understand it's going to take a few moments to come up with a response to this question, so please take your time. And so make sure you demonstrate patience not only with what you say, but how you're acting. Try to make sure that, you know, smile, wait patiently uh, for that candidate to respond so that they can reach back and find that experience that they want to share. It's important for you as an interviewer to insist on a specific behavior-based response. In some cases, you ask a behavior-based interview question, and the person will respond, well, I generally do this, I, or I generally do that. And we're not really looking for that. Rather, we're looking for specifics. And so if they do tend to respond with a, with a more of a general response, you want to say, okay, now, what I want you to do is think about for a moment a time when you specifically did that, a time when you, referring back to some of the questions, when you had an angry customer. I don't know what you generally might do or what you generally do, but tell me about a specific time when an angry customer confronted you. What was the issue? How did you address it? So we want to insist on a specific response. We want to listen intently and seek clarification. So we want to demonstrate good listening skills, uh, provide those minimal, minimal encouragers, you know, shake our head to you know, keep that information coming. And if there's a question that we have, we want to seek that. We want to make sure that we understand what they actually did in that specific situation. We certainly don't want to lead them in any way, shape, or form to a, to a correct response, but we want to, sh we want to make sure that we, we, we understand that experience well enough 
so that we can then move on to the next question. We likely want to make a few notes of what the candidate has said with regard to each question so that we can, as we're looking at our list of candidates later, we can recall what was said generally and hopefully make some good decisions from there. We want to be mindful of time requirements. As I indicated before, behavior-based interviews tend to take longer than other interviews because it does require time for reflection. And, and in some cases, the responses the candidates give are going to be very long. And so we certainly want to, if, if a response is going way too long for the time that we have, we want to kind of draw it to a close, you know, try to say, okay, now, can you just summarize for me very quickly what it was you did? You know, because maybe the response that they're giving is, is way too long. So we want to we want to make sure that we manage the time. And we want to make sure that we don't have so many questions that we can't ask them all in the allotted time. And so I would say for a half hour interview, six questions, probably six, maybe seven, if they don't require perhaps as much reflection as others might, uh, might be the total number that you can ask. So be mindful of your time requirements. And then finally, and I think this is the, a real critical one, before the interview try to identify the attributes of a satisfactory or good response to each question. And so what that means, so we've selected some behavior-based questions, and here's an example here. We've selected some behavior-based questions. Now, what would we look for in a satisfactory response is what, we, what, what I'm asking. So for example, let's say the behavior-based question was, describe a situation where you did not discover a mistake prior to distributing a report or product. How did you discover the mistake? What action did you take? What did you learn? So that's a complete behavior-based question. And so what would I be looking for in a good response? Well, probably that they informed our constituent, their constituents quickly, that they made the necessary changes promptly, that they apologized, and this is probably the most important thing, that they owned the problem and they didn't blame others. So that's, that's really critical to me, so I want to make sure they do that. They, they exhibit an understanding of the importance of having reviews and fail-safes and has implemented these to avoid future issues. So that's what I would be looking for in, in, in a good response. And so responses that come in suggesting something better than that would be marked higher on the scale, right? They'd be marked maybe a five as, a, as opposed to a three or a four on a five-point scale. Whereas as responses that come in with some deficiencies, they don't meet that standard, would be rated less. So, there you have some background on behavior-based interview questions. I, I now want to talk about some of the legal aspects of interviews uh, so that, uh, you know, as we're seeking to find the best candidate, we, we certainly don't want to end up discriminating uh, against somebody on the basis of protected class. And so let me just refer you to, for just a few moments, uh, DHRM R477-2-3, which is the DHRM rule titled Fair Employment Practices. And what this rule says is that employment decisions must not be based upon race, religion, national origin, color, gender, age, disability. Those are the common things that we know discrimination must not be based upon, or, or employment actions of any kind must not be based upon those factors. But also within DHRM rules, we cannot base our employment decisions upon political affiliation, except for maybe the highest levels of, of, our, of our agencies. We should not base our decisions on any protected activity under the anti-discrimination statutes. In other words, if somebody has been a complainant, a witness, or, or, or whatever in a, in a case involving race discrimination, religious discrimination, or, or whatever, you must not use that information to make employment decisions. You must not discriminate somebody against somebody on the basis of military status or affiliation. So you can't discriminate against somebody because they're a veteran. You can't discriminate against somebody because they have a reserve or National Guard commitment. Those must not be factors that you take into account uh, during a hiring interview. Furthermore, you must not consider any other non-job related factor when making employment decisions. And I ask, why would you want to? Why would you want to consider any factor that doesn't suggest that the candidate has the skills needed to do the job? So once again, let's go back to our model. At the very beginning, we talked about identifying the, looking at the job description, identifying the technical competencies, and identifying those behavioral competencies, and basing our selection process on those, on those things. All right, so, so given our fair employment practices, what should be done? Interview questions must not elicit information regarding these protected classes. Uh, in other words, your questions shouldn't be formulated such that they might gather information regarding a protected class as we've described them either intentionally or unintentionally. We'll talk, we'll give you a little bit, we'll give you some examples here in just a few moments. If any such information is disclosed during that hiring interview, it is wise to tell the candidate 
that that information will not be used in making an employment decision. That way you go on record of telling them that that information will not be used. Uh, maybe they disclose that they're in the Army Reserve. Maybe they disclose that they served an LDS mission or, or, or whatever else. You want to make sure that they understand that that is not a factor in, in making a hiring decision. Or perhaps that they have dependent children, they have daycare issues and, and so on, to the, to the extent that those daycare issues don't interfere with their ability to, to come to work and do the job. And we also want to avoid small talk about such topics. You know, when, when a person arrives at the interview, it's, it's great to engage in some small talk to, to set the tone for, you know, an, maybe an informal environment and, and to make sure that the candidate relaxes so they can give their best responses. We, you know, so the small talk should be associated with those typical things like, how was the ride in? Were you able to find parking easily? And, th and things like that are just great. But if you're, if you're talking more about personal questions, chances are they, they, that, those, that type of small talk may elicit some of this information that is illegal to consider in making an employment decision. So be careful with small talk. All right. So you may have some questions now. Uh, there, so there are some elements. I call them challenging areas of concern. You may be concerned with a person's ability to do the physical requirements of the job. And so let's say that this job requires an individual to lift 50 pounds. And so in order to avoid any sort of discrimination under the Americans with Disabilities Act or disability discrimination, we want to ask the question this way. This position requires employees to routinely lift 50 pounds. Can you fulfill this requirement with or without reasonable accommodation? That's a legitimate question because we're, we're asking them, can they do this? Can they, can they physically perform this task? Now, if there is an accommodation needed, we'll talk about that later. Once the hiring decision is made and so on, they can divulge any accommodations they may need to perform the essential job functions. But we're not to ask about those abilities up front. So let me tell you a question to avoid along this line. Don't ask. Don't ask. Let me emphasize that. Don't do not. Uh, the question, will you have any problems with being able to lift 50 pounds? Because that actually s seems to elicit, okay, well, I have this bad back. We don't want to know about the person's bad back in the interview process. We don't want to consider that information until later, until once a hiring decision has been made. Another area of concern you might have is schedule. Let's say that we've established that an 8 to 5 schedule is mandatory for this position. Why? Because they work at the front front desk, the service counter. They need to be there when our customers arrive, when our customers begin start, to start arriving at 8. And so we might ask the question, this schedule, the schedule for this position is Monday through Friday from 8 to 5. Can you meet the expectations of the schedule with or without reasonable accommodation? Once again, we, we include that. So in the event there is some concern that they have, perhaps they may have some requirements from time to time to have a medical appointment in the mornings or whatever, They're, they can talk to you about those later. But, but don't talk to those. Don't, don't talk about those issues within the interview process. Don't ask once again. Will you have any problems meeting the schedule? Because we really don't want to know what their problems are. We simply want to know whether or not they'll be able to fulfill the schedule requirements. We may be concerned with their expected longevity. We certainly don't want to ask questions: Are you pregnant or planning to become pregnant? But we might ask questions such as: Where do you see yourself professionally in five years? It's not a behavior-based question, but it's a question that it might identify whether or not this person is committed to the profession, committed to, the, to the working in the field that they've chosen. We might ask the question, why did you leave your last job? Now, once again, if that question tends to elicit protected class information, such as a disability or, or a, a medical leave problem or something else, we don't want to go there. But it might be a, a way to kind of ascertain whether or not they're going to find an environment with us that they won't leave shortly, you know, shortly after being hired. If language proficiency has been established within our, our job qualifications, we certainly can ask, do you speak such and such language fluently? So for example, do you speak Spanish fluently? But only ask such a question if it is essential for the job. And don't ask how this, the language was learned. It's important that we avoid that because you know, it could result in you know, apparent uh, discrimination based on national origin if we were to ask that. And fundamentally, if, if we want language proficiency, it's probably best for them to demonstrate that as opposed to ask questions about it. Anyway, these are just some challenging areas of concern that I wanted to share with you. They're predominantly not behavioral based, but they're nonetheless things that might be important to you as you make a hiring decision. I would suggest that most of these, if, if you were interested in these types of things, could be front loaded. They probably should be asked in the application rather than in the interview itself. And so if you have these areas of concern, uh, by all means, work with your analysts to see if they can't be front loaded into the application. All right, let me just give you some quick tips on the interview format as we, as we try to wrap things up this morning. 
With an interview process, it's important that we put the candidate at ease. And so it's important for the interview panel members to, to greet the candidate, that they introduce themselves uh, briefly, and to, you know, know who the candidate is and, and to, you know, maybe talk about the weather or the write-in or, or those types of things that, that might uh, break the ice a little bit. Uh, your goal should be to make the candidate feel comfortable. We, we tend to perform at our best when we feel comfortable, and we truly want our candidates to be able to perform at their best. We, we, don't, want them, we don't want nervousness to get in the way of their interview performance. Uh, then you might, once you've engaged in that sort of small talk, making the candidate feel comfortable, you might introduce the interview format. So here's a kind of a standard way to introduce an interview. Uh, first, we have some questions for you. Uh, then we'll give you an opportunity to ask questions you have of us. And finally, we'll tell you what happens next. And so that's kind of a, a useful framework for setting the stage for an interview once, you've, once you're done with the small talk and ready to move on. If there were some type of role play or activity uh, that was included in the process or a writing sample or whatever, then you would probably include that here as one of the elements as well. Finally, we encourage you to end the interview on a positive note. Uh, certainly don't give the candidate who you like the impression that you're going to select them because they may not in fact be the candidate you select. But for all candidates, make sure that you interview, you end the interview with a smile, on, on a positive note, with the handshaking and all those things that are associated with, with, with an interview and, and then make sure that they know what will happen next. So now we're at the point where our interviews are done and we want to select the uh, the best candidate. Uh, let me emphasize the importance of having a panel interview. I, I believe that most, if not all, state agencies have panel interviews as opposed to individual interviews. Uh, you've, you've all heard the adage that uh, two heads are better than one. Well, six ears are better than two as well. So it's important to have a, a group of people there that, that can actually you know, pick up on what the candidate's saying and, and help to make an informed decision of, of who the best candidate is based on the interview. What we often do when we're doing our interviews is after the interviews are all concluded, we have our panel members individually rank order the candidates. Uh, considering their interview performance, how they responded to the questions, and job-related training, education, and, and experience that might be relevant to the job. Uh, so we have them identify by rank order. We then share those rankings with one another. We oftentimes use the board, the whiteboard, and we put our candidates up there, and we share our rankings. We discuss our reasons for the rankings, and then hopefully achieve some consensus on, on a rank ordered list. We, we identify, well, who are the candidates who are probably the best uh, among among the candidates that we interviewed, the one, the two, the three candidates who kind of stand out from the rest. If we if we can find some agreement around those, we, we can probably make a, a good selection decision. We might at that point uh, decide to have a second interview, or I, I, rather than decide then, we probably decided that up front that we do want to have second interviews. So we would refer those candidates one, two, or three candidates onto that second interview, which is which is an important step for for positions that are mission critical. I think and so on. So that's kind of a, a basic format for the interview process and, and selecting the best candidate. Once you've made a decision, it's important for you as a hiring manager to ensure that you have an objective job-related reason for selecting the chosen candidate. In other words, if you were asked to articulate why you selected this person over this other person, you're able to do that. Uh, and so it, it doesn't require much more than that. I think in, in, in general, as long as we focus on job-related interview questions, job-related selection processes where we, we, we tend to have some legitimacy in the eyes of the courts and, and making our decisions when somebody might be uh, alleging that they've been discriminated against or, or whatever else. If we could formulate a job-related reason for what the decision we made, we're, we're more often than not safe. Finally, I, I just like to recommend that we do, don't, don't neglect to do reference checks. As we said before, Behavior-based questions are based on the premise that past behavior is a predictor of future behavior. So we truly want to, if we're able to reach back to those jobs, those references, places where they've worked before, and ask them how the person behaved, right? What did they do? Uh, were, were they actually successful in their work and so on? Uh, keep in mind, you may not ask any inquiry of a reference that you would not be able to ask of the candidates. So you've got to avoid all those protected questions pertaining to all those protected classes that we described. And we understand that it's, it's challenging to get references sometimes, but it does show due diligence on your part if you're a hiring manager, if you're going to actually make every effort to, to reach back into that person's employment history uh, to check those references. You might uh, check with your HR analyst to see if they have a form that might help with that reference checking process or any additional tips that they might have for how you might go about checking those references. We have come 
to the end of my formal presentation. Uh, we've got a question here. What is an example of a non-job related factor? Well, I, I think it would be, for example, have you served an LDS church mission? Uh, you know, I had a, a, a kind of a bad experience here many, many, many years ago, but I, I recall receiving the resumes back from the candidates that were interviewed, and one of the interview panel members had put RM on the resume, and I'm thinking, holy cow. And, and so it was just, it was a very, very inappropriate thing to ask about, and certainly an inappropriate thing to, to make a, a to, to put on the resume. So we, we don't want to elicit any information about protected class. We want to focus our interview questions on things that are job related and, and avoid, of course, non-job related factors. The next question is, what do you recommend if a candidate asks you not to contact a former supervisor? Well, I would recommend that you ask why. <laughs> and if there's and there's some legitimacy there, maybe it's maybe it's they don't want them contacted. Because if it's their current supervisor, they may not want may not want the, the current supervisor to know that they're looking for other work. But you know, I think generally speaking, you want to you want to understand why they would why they would want you to, to respect that request, and and maybe then you'll understand. Uh, you know, you'll say, okay, I won't. But is there somebody then who I can call who can who can speak to your qualifications as it relates to this position? I think it'd be important for you to follow up with other references. The next question is, uh, when I seek clarification or response to the interview questions, how much do I have to worry that HR must approve these clarification or follow-up questions? I would say so long as the question, that the follow-up questions are, are about the same topic, you're just trying to better understand what that person has done, what they did in that particular situation, it should be all right. Once again, avoiding any reference to any of those illegal areas, I think, I think you should be safe in exploring those, those, the, the, the original question further with the candidate by asking them some additional follow-up questions. Who should be included in the interview panel? Recommendations. Well, I, I think many folks might be included. I, you know, when I'm interviewing, I, I might like to invite my boss to the table. I might like to invite some folks that are would be this person's peers to the table. I think that's useful. Uh, I think I might like to invite even a, even a customer to the table uh, to to conduct those interviews. We we certainly want people that will be unbiased that will help us to select the best candidate, uh, not using subjective information or subjective criteria, but the objective criteria we we derive from the interview itself and from reviewing the candidate's uh, qualifications. And the next question is, is there a preferred diversity for panel members? I would think I, I, I would think it's generally a good idea to to have a diverse panel. Sometimes it's impossible. We want we don't necessarily want diversity for diversity's sake, but we certainly want we want the best people there to interview. But it makes sense to have people that are going to look like your applicants there. So it's good to have a panel that's composed of males and females, if you, particularly if you have male and female applicants. It's good to have a panel that represents the state's workforce in terms of, of, of race or the, your, your organization's workforce in terms of race and national origin, those types of things, particularly if that applicant pool is diverse. So I think that's important. How do you feel about a written test prior to interviews? These would be a written technical test specific to the job. I think that's okay. Uh, I would ask that you work with your HR analyst in, in creating that test. You know, if, if it's, it might be very helpful for them to write down what they know without somebody else telling them what to write, as they might do when they're, re when they're actually applying for the job. So that might be a helpful practice. But just ensure that those questions are job related. That would be really critical, that they're job related. All right, folks. Um, we are about out of time, but let me let me refer you to the last uh, power, the last slide of my PowerPoint here. I would like to continue our conversation on LinkedIn. Uh, the Utah Leadership Institute has a LinkedIn account, and in just a few moments, when we, after we conclude here, I will send you a link to it so that you can sign up for the Utah Leadership Institute LinkedIn account. Uh, Within that, within that, uh, you'll find a, a question stream. I'm going to ask. I ask two questions there for you. Uh, one is, what is your favorite interview question or interviewing technique? So, if you're if you're willing and able, we'd we'd like you to share what you've done that was successful. Uh, and if you just want to see what others have done, uh, by all means, uh, review what what our contributors write, and and maybe you can adapt some or adopt some of those practices. The other question that I asked there are what are your remaining questions from the webinar on interviewing and employee selection? So if you didn't get your question answered today, uh, you'll have an opportunity to go out to the LinkedIn account and, and answer, ask those questions. 
If you still have questions remaining, uh, by all means, you can also send me an email. Or I, I would suggest uh, that you also contact your agency HR analyst, and, and they should be able to help you with that. So I do very much appreciate your attendance today and your participation in this webinar. I encourage you to join us uh, uh, for the LinkedIn conversation uh, if you have additional questions or if you want to share something you've done that's been successful. Uh, thank you very much, and have a, have a great day and a great week.